Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. I just realized my audio was down on that. Sorry for the intro that was silent the whole time. Um, <laughs> I'm in with Elfie today. Where's Elfie at? Elfie! Are you in the How's house? it going? Yay! So, uh, Yay. we're finally back streaming again. Feels like forever, doesn't it? Feel like it's been like 400 years. Yeah, really. I even took a look and like, Wow, because I see the log when we last came on, like, yeah, it has been that long. Okay. It hasn't. You're like, wow, like, how did it feel to do research again? Did it feel good to get back in the groove of it? Oh, yeah, it feels nice. It Ooh. does. I do. I like our schedule. Like, I'm glad that we're back in it, which, speaking of that, how has the last eight months been for you with negotiations? <laughs> you know, it's always fun just smiling she's like it's been great it's been great 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 <laughs> no it was good it's good you know we're in a good place oh, it's good. future's great yeah it's just it's stressful it's never you know it's not like the funnest thing to do in, in the world you know but we're glad where we're at and we can finally i'm finally getting back on social media i feel like i i've been gone from social media for like 400 years too my God, Crystal's still alive. I know. Oh, where is she? <laughs> there she is. She's alive. No. <laughs> so, um, I'm really excited for today's topic because this is one of those topics that I'm fascinated by, which is Jack the Ripper. Is it one of that you just always go back to? Because is it because it's unsolved? Is that why it's so like, like so curious for us to want to be involved with this case constantly? So, and I'll say, I feel like it was also one of the first kind of true crime cases I remember ever coming across like when I first started reading anything paranormal strange I think Jack the Ripper probably was one of the first ones that came into it mm -hmm. well and it's still so like question marks they don't know who it was um, obviously mm -hmm. DNA samples it's, it happened the murder started in 1888 this was in Whitechapel London there's so many conspiracy theories behind it that we're going to dive into also with H.H. H. Holmes could it's you know that's the, everyone wants him involved i think just because of he was such an elite here in the united states as like america's first real known serial killer but even now there's new conspiracy theories coming out that jack the ripper could have been a female like possibly midwife because back in that time thank you guys for the follow we've had a few new followers Back in that time, um, midwives were more popular to be involved with women giving birth than mm -hmm. actual doctors. And that's because women didn't feel comfortable with men, and predominantly men were doctors. So now the conspiracy theory is, was it a midwife? Because midwives would have really known the female anatomy well for these, like, oh, yeah. murders to... Like, these are pretty, like, brutal murders. Like... Do we really know if these women were alive while they were being, you know, cut apart? We really don't know, do we? We don't know. I think they, they have theorized, like, the first, like, the first kill was possibly the kill, the actual, like, killing kill uh, hit. And then the actual, like, disembowelment and everything hopefully was done after they were dead and everything. I mean, like, I mean, you read over it and it just gets more and more grisly every every victim you read about and everything. I, it does seem like he went, like, he started, or whoever, he, she, whoever it was, started getting very, like, violent. Like, I feel like the first death wasn't as bad, and then it just progressively just got, is that how, is that how you feel about it? Yeah, it's, it's almost like they, they got, um, more confident in mm -hmm. what they were doing. Like, the first one was, they weren't too sure. That's why I think probably, because they talk about a few killings um around that time that no one's ever been able to say yes for sure if it was a ripper murder so i can right. see like the first early ones were like hesitant not sure about it. and then as they really get into it that's when you see it getting more uh brave and really into doing it because now they have a pattern set it is a pattern it was always well most of the time it was street walkers or prostitutes at the time 
Now, mm-hmm. before we get into this, like, full discussion, I do want to say that back in that time of 1888, you know, really up until recently, like, 50s, 60s era, women didn't have a lot of options for jobs. And I don't think people realize that when you really think about the time and the era that they were stuck in. So theoretically, you could have been a nurse or you could have been a teacher. And that was about it. Everything, you were really meant to be a wife, like your husband's shadow. And prostitutes were really, really shamed at that time. I mean, I know still to this day they are. But you have to look at it in a sense of they were really probably one of the first authentic entrepreneurs, don't you think? It, and you also had to look to that this was an era that was the, the poor, so the poor, so they had even less opportunities. I mean, you had the workhouses and you had maybe some minimal, but not really big opportunities for women. So there was like basically workhouse or possibly selling your body on the street. And that was like kind of your, which, which option do you want right or be or not eat essentially and not have a roof over your head or find someone to marry and just become a housewife and like i've made jokes with cat about this and i mean it sincerely if i were in that era i would have been street walking because i wouldn't have been able to deal with being in a husband's shadow i don't know how you feel about it but what other options do you you're right you have no other options as a female to be on your own feet and take care of yourself and I can't imagine being put in that position. So I believe uh, at least most of the these women were older women too. So they were possibly out out of the realm of at that point um, marriage. Like when you hit when the, I think they were like in their forties. So when you hit in your forties, at that point they considered you like an old maid mm-hmm. and not really marriage material. So it, their prospects got even like lower. Well, even everything. then, think about this too. At that time, like we're stepping back in that era, which is why I love the sensation of like thinking in that era. Even if you were a widow or divorced, you were basically used and not wanted essentially, and like that was shamed in the eyes of the church. So even if you would have been married and your husband died and he maybe he didn't leave something for you, you had to figure it out for yourself, there is really not a big possibility of you finding someone else to replace that husband. So Especially if you were older and everything. Also, there was, it was a weird, like I've read some of the morning stuff when, when a woman lost her husband, they became a widow. It was this weird kind of limbo area of one hand, they kind of, if you were young enough to still have children, you should go and marry. If you were older and possibly not able to have children, then you should basically mourn your husband mm-hmm. for the rest of your life. And we probably could connect that slightly to Queen Victoria and the fact that she technically never married after Prince Albert passed away. But yeah, it was one of those like, if you're young enough to still have kids, yes, go get married. Mm-hmm. If you're older, then you were just kind of usually. Uh, the family would take care of like the relatives of the husband or your own relatives or anything possibly took care of you after that well and why like the thought is is if you are an independent female in that time and you're essentially before your era what if you don't want your family to take care of you what if you want to find your own way and there's just you're in an era that there's no options for you to find your own way and this is it hopefully had enough money then because that was the only way really you would ever see any women have any kind of independence is they somehow had a fortune left to them or some estate that was the only way they could really have any kind of independence if they had the fortune really. if they had it which was rare and obviously mm-hmm. if we're talking about the era of Whitechapel, london it's known for being sort of a slummy area Especially back mm-hmm. in 1888, it was definitely known as the poorer area. So I guess the the biggest thing I want to open everyone's mind up to before we start this discussion is understanding that um, these women weren't just sex workers. They shouldn't be shamed for being prostitutes. That it was the only form of work that they could have to actually feed themselves and if they had a family. And um, it shouldn't be shamed because it's even to this day, it's still entrepreneur work in my eyes. Okay, so this is deep because this is crazy. Like, whoever was doing this was insane. So this started in 1888. Should we start with just jump in with H.H. Holmes really quick? Because he was like pre-1888. 
So H.H. H. Holmes was around 1886. He was convicted, if you're not familiar with H.H. H. Holmes. He basically had this like madhouse that he had created for the Chicago World Fair. Um, I can't even remember. I think there was over 100 rooms or about 100 rooms in it. I've done a stream on it before. And H.H. H. Holmes was a doctor, and he basically created this madhouse. Um, they believe the, um, the creators or directors of Saw, the movie, sort of gained inspiration from H.H. H. Holmes, which is basically this maze of a house. You have to figure out your way out, and if you don't figure out your way out, you die. Except H.H. H. Holmes didn't really give you that option. Um, he basically would turn these bedrooms that these people would rent, much like a hotel, and they would go into the bedrooms and he would gas, gas them. They were literally essentially gas chambers. He did, there were, I mean, he had so many different rooms with different ways. This is just one example. And he would literally wait for them to pass out. Sometimes they weren't completely dead and he'd have to go strangle them. Sometimes they were dead from the gas chamber and he had body shoots connected to each of the rooms. And he would body shoot literally, he admitted to like, I think 36, 37 deaths, but they literally found hundreds of possible bodies that had been dismembered in the basement, okay? It, he was like twisted and he was a doctor. So he studied anatomy, he was capable of doing it. He had a lot of money. He built this like place from like scratch. Literally, he created this like crazy madhouse. So when he ended up getting outed, um, they went into the basement. They found like literally like they had the heads separated in piles. He had femurs separated in the piles. And that's why they were never ever able to put an actual number total on how many people were down there because it, it had just been a stray with like bones. So he did yeah. admit to 36 bodies, or 38, however many it was. He was obviously convicted. This was 1886, so we're talking about two years before the Whitechapel murder. Now remember, H.H. H. Holmes paid people off, and that's how he got away with it for so long. That's why he had so many you know, fatalities in the basement that he was basically doing these experiments on these, on these people. So there's a conspiracy theory that H.H. H. Holmes had so much money from being a, a physician for having this, this madhouse where people were paying him to stay there like a hotel. They think that there's a possibility when he was convicted, he was supposed to be hanged in 1886. They believe there's a possibility he paid off the police, the jurisdiction, uh, the people involved because of his wealth. And essentially they let him escape and they put a different convict in his place. The reason this conspiracy theory has come to light is because the person that was may have been hung in H.H. H. Holmes' place, they never let anyone see his face. He basically had a bag over his head the whole time while he was hanged. So there was a person hanged, but the yeah. person was never seen. So the theory is, is basically he paid off law enforcement, all these people to, to get off, which let's be real, that stuff still happens to this day. I mean, it's essentially happening with the Britney Spears case. Like, the conservator's been paying people and everybody off for him to remain in control, and that's what money and power does. With the elite, Harvey Weinstein was doing it. I mean, I could go on and on, so it still happens. So they think that, or they conspiracy, conspiracize, however you want to say it, that he hopped on a boat, ship, went across the pond to London, and, you know, waited it out for a couple of years for things to slow down. And then suddenly now, 1888, two years later, we have the Whitechapel murders that are happening in the jurisdiction of London. And these women are being, uh, like like Elfie said, there's some sort of blow that happens of murder. And then someone is doing an actual uh, physician's work of dissection. Is that the best way to put it? Essentially, because uh, I believe like the they, they talk about, because I... One theory is that the main weapon was this very long, thin knife that was essentially what surger, surgeons use and everything. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, dissected, essentially, which is kind of amazing because if you think about it, like, these, this was done at night. Like, there wasn't really much in the way of light anywhere. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of street lamps or anything. So to be able to dissect the body with barely any light and know where to go and what to do and everything like that's pretty impressive no matter what they said it was with precision it was perfect cuts it was uh, mm -hmm. some sort of knowledge that only a doctor would have and you also have to take back for a minute and remember it was his 1888 
This is a time where the internet doesn't exist and books are probably hard to come by. And you're also talking about a low income area. The Whitechapel area at the time was a low, low income area. And you're, how are you going to find someone in a low income area that's a supposed uh, doctor or knows anatomy so well? to be able to dissecting human beings in the pitch black of night. So the the conspiracy theory is H.H. H. Holmes essentially went to London and that was possibly who it was. No one was ever caught in this. So do you, what do you think about the H.H. H. Holmes conspiracy? I've, I've heard of it and everything. Um, I've heard the, the idea that, which I do find interesting, the fact that they, they executed him and he had his bag, the bag over his head the entire time. Like they didn't, I'm guess they didn't let him do it's like final words or anything is kind of unusual for mm -hmm. it's day and everything. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's a bit of a reach. I mean, unless like I I've seen people like you see hear about like you said where people they pay off other people, but that is a lot of people pay off and with all the stuff he had done, it's like unless he was giving them a lot of money. Right, I, I don't agree. know. I feel like the bit of a reach. I do well. I th you know I'm not gonna say never say never because I feel like mm -hmm. you know other think conspiracies have been proven true, so I won't yeah. say never. But I do feel like you know even if he were capable of paying off a bunch of people, whether that's jurors or judges or police departments, whatever, at the end of the day, like you're letting go someone who has literally dismembered hundreds of bodies. And I don't know why they would, like, be comfortable with letting that person go that, like, dismembered that. Like, that's a fear to the community. And, like, it, wherever he goes, like, that's a big problem. Like, you could be his next victim. So, yeah, I don't, I think it's a, I do think it's a reach as well. But I'll also say never say never. Because it is well, yeah. odd how the timelines line up, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it it is odd. Though, I, it's interesting if you look at, too, with the, the Victorian era and, just how many murders and uh, grisly stuff was going on back then. It was like it was it was pretty horrifying, mm -hmm. <laughs> horrifying really. But mm -hmm. it's one of those like unless even if they're like we're going to put you on the boat and send you somewhere else and you're not allowed to ever come back to America again. It's like really did he pay you that much to be like you're someone else's problem now, right. not ours. <laughs> right. Well, and like, how does one travel, you know, from Chicago to essentially the East Coast to leave, right? Like, he'd have to get to probably New York was probably one of the main harbors out. So, yep. I mean, news still travels fast, especially with the, you know, think about Lizzie Borden. That spread like a wildfire, too, back in the day. Oh, yeah. So, you, I guess, feel, you feel like, I don't know. I agree. I just agree. Like, Someone it could have happened, but then, like... I don't know. I, I feel like someone would have talked somewhere in in the mix of it in the jail, in the police. There, someone would have said something to someone at some point, going like, "Guess what?" or "Did you know?" Mm -hmm. at, at some point in time, even if they were retired, and they're like, "I remember when we decided to let H. H. Holmes go." Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Like you would be like, "Oh yeah," like uh, article comes out of. Sort of like there was some like spy that recently died um, from the UK that said that he was a part of being planning Diana's death, Princess Diana's death or something. But still, then you look at him like half of the people are going to be like, okay, I agree that like, you know, the, the royal family planned her death. And then other half of people are going to look at him and be like, are you just trying to like reach for straws? You know, like, so it is, it's hard. So even if there was proof that it, it was H.H. H. Holmes, it's still a conspiracy because our people are going to believe it or not. Didn't they at some point recently try to do like DNA tests or something on his grave? Yeah, they were. Yeah, but well, it was it was complicated too because they tore down the H.H. H. Holmes house to like or like the apartment complex, whatever you want to call it, and now it's like a a haunted post office or something. Um, but it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they've tried to dig into it. There was a, like an ancestor from H.H. H. Holmes that was trying to, but I don't, it, you know, hear anything else. So it's like, obviously it didn't go anywhere. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so carrying on. So let's go on the timeline. So you did all this, um, history. Do you want to chat about the first death, which was April 3rd of 1888? Well, it's interesting. The April 3rd one is Emma Smith and... This is where um, it's interesting with the kind of, 
you know Jack the Ripper case is so famous when it has its own name by Ripperology and everything. <laughs> He's like, yeah, he has his own term terminology, yeah. literally. He has his own terminology. He has his little subgroup of true crime people and everything. So apparently this is also where it becomes so aggravating between the case and the newspapers and the sensationalizing where it seemed like almost every time a crime happened in this this one, like this summer of 1888, it was suddenly, it was Jack the Ripper. Mm -hmm. No matter what it was, it was like, it had to be Jack the Ripper. Mm -hmm. Someone died. Jack the Ripper. So, in other words, they were overly blaming deaths on always Jack the Ripper. Oh, yeah. they were freaking out. So, like, you had April 3rd, you had Emma Smith, who was attacked, and actually, she was attacked, and she died a day later at the London Hospital and everything. Um, I believe it was, like, stab and possibly strangle, but nothing to quite the extent, nothing to what the later... Um, deaths were like in brutality and everything mm -hmm. so but she did die the next day at the hospital and whatnot and they apparently later falsely filed her under the ripper murders and everything okay so they don't it's indefinite no one really knows if it, it could have been it may not have been they don't really know indefinitely. Yeah. okay now i could see it possibly being just because like i said um the early ones were much not as grisly as it gets so i could see maybe it was like she could have been like his, his he like, like a tryout or like the first yes yeah. tryout and it just went wrong see how someone or, fights back or something like that yeah pretty much and just just left it as is and everything and didn't go any further so was I could she see able that to happen. identify anybody do you know or anything like that uh, I believe the police did check but nothing was really conclusive and she died quite soon after uh, being admitted to the hospital. Wow. And also, I believe this was all still early enough on that they weren't really looking into a serial killer. Like, this was just a spat or stabbing or something has happened in this area and it's just, it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, see, it wasn't, it isn't actually until August 7th in 1888 that Martha Tabram uh, was found in on land of George Yard Landing. Wow, so April, and May, June, is... July, August, so five months later. If mm -hmm. if the first one was connected, it took a whole five months. So what it is gives you a question, like, was it the, the same? Was it, like, identified as Jack the Ripper? Did it take him five months to get brave and come back out to try it again? It does, it does give you questions. See, so just especially, like, first time didn't work just maybe uh it was a whim of the moment like we're going to try this and it didn't work so maybe he uh staked out the area checked out the area probably tried to familiarize himself with the the white chapel that general neighborhood to maybe find the right spots or um places to be more discreet on what he wanted to do mm -hmm. so it could have taken him some time to almost stock or stake out the area that he wanted to be in. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Elfie's thinking like a serial killer. Everybody watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. Okay, so um, August 7th, this yeah. is Martha. So, Martha um, Tamron, but the one that's usually marked as like the first one or first official that they're like, for sure, this is Ripper, this is Jack the Ripper, was Mary Ann Nichols, mm -hmm. and she was found in Bucks Row Whitechapel. And that's uh, where you essentially get the Whitechapel killings from. That's where it all begins, really. So do we know how Martha died? So Martha died August 7th. They're not sure if that was directly related to Jack the Ripper. But the first yeah. actual Jack the Ripper case was Mary Ann, which is August 31st. So do we know what happened to Martha? Um, let's see here. Because if Emma was basically stabbed in an, an attempted strangle, which most of them were somehow, like, neck cut, right? Like, in that yeah, area? Yeah, most of them were uh, throat cut and stabbed. I don't believe with Martha that um, at that point there was any dissection of the body. I believe Mary is the first one that you see any dissection and anything where her abdomen's open and her throat's cut and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not until after her that it becomes more and more... Uh, pronounced. Well, they sort of, it's like if you guys have watched CSI or like, I love all the crime shows, obviously, and I'm, I'm a true crime addict, but it's sort of like you can't create or, or make a composite 
profile of who you're looking for unless you've had a certain amount of victims that have had like repetitive things happen and if I don't know if I'm wrong but I remember doing research about this a long time ago and the police were giving statements regarding the actual dissections because there were most of the same police were on the same cases over and over again and mm-hmm. have you read this, Elfie, that the police were actually so, like, disgusted, they were, like, vomiting at the scene because it was so grotesque? It, it was, like, horrendous looking. I mean, and the thing is, too, is, like, let's see if I can find... There's, like, a composite set, sketch for the police news of her and trying to uh, find out who it is. Um, oh, she's not the one. There was later ones where it got even more grizzly, like basically chopping off pieces from her face and everything. Ew, Jesus, these word. How yeah, can you, uh, how can you do that to a human? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. It's it's weird. Well, it's it's fascinating where it's. This is where I think a lot of the people who study this try to figure out is the why of it because on one hand, most people think okay, she. He went, they went after prostitutes because they probably figured prostitutes were the least likely to be really focused on True. or really um, Cared thought about, of honestly. Like, second thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that possibly their target. I know some theories are like because the, the whoever the Ripper was had gotten some veneer of the seeds from a prostitute or there was some connection between them and and the brothels and that's what they what uh, that they were basically releasing their anger upon them i'm gonna blurt something out just because i feel like i need to i know we're not done yet but in my opinion mm-hmm. i don't think it's hh H. holmes i think it's a great theory though i do love the theory because it does it's amazing that the timelines line up i don't think it was midwife although we'll chat about that too later I think it was, because it was prostitutes, you know, you're talking about overanalyzation of, like, psychology, right? Like, I love psychology. I've studied a lot of psychology in college. I'm obsessed with it. Like, if I wasn't a filmmaker, I would probably be a criminal psychologist because I'm so obsessed with the way serial killers think. And I've studied serial killers, like, you know, um, Ted Bundy, um, John Wayne Gacy. Like, I've studied them. And they usually have a pattern of a certain type that they like. So for John Wayne Gacy, it is children, which is really terrible. I hope he's rotting in hell. Um, Another one, like Ted Bundy, is um, dark-haired brunettes that are college girls, right? So they have a type. So for Jack the Ripper, the type is prostitutes. So for Mm -hmm. some reason, he thinks, I think it was a man because they're overpowering these women easily in the streets. I don't really think that a woman could be able to overpower another woman, but I think it's a male. I think that this person had mommy issues, and I think that whoever it was was maybe abused in some way by their mother, and they were taking it out on these women as just like a dissection tool. And I think it was almost like, you're right, a stress relief to just like kill these women and dissect them. And they're scum of the street in their eyes. It's just a prostitute. No one will miss you anyways. That's my opinion. That's my blurt on it. That's how I, that's who I think did it, is somebody who had some serious mommy issues. Um, Okay, so Martha was 1888. So the official first case was Emma. Okay, so let's just go over the timeline again. April 3rd, then we skip back to August 7th, then we go to August 31st. So August 31st is where we're really getting the label of his official first victim because Mary Ann is absolutely destroyed. Her full abdomen is basically, like, this person unwrapped her intestines. Am I right? Yeah. And left it beside her and and removed other organs. And it's always, why is it always in the abdomen and uterus? That's another reason that makes me think it's just a man that's angry with a female. You know what I mean? Like... It's something that's a male that's angry with the power empowerment of women or mommy issues because he wants to destroy the womanhood of the uterus, is my opinion on it. Yeah, I think this was uh, this was one that had both the entrails and the uterus, uterus beside them. Ugh. I think. What if goes, like, it just makes you wonder what goes in your head. Okay, you know what I'm thinking? I'm going to do take out the uterus. I'm just going to set it right here. Like, the the mind of, like, seriously, you know? Like, you're doing it. But that's, that's so, like, a, it's just, it's, you also have to think, like, they're doing this practically in darkness, being able to find anything and being able to scoop it out in one piece and set it aside. I know, but who, what? You're, it's, it's crazy. 
Because you're right, it's precision, it's anatomy, oh, yeah. knowing anatomy, it's, you're, I mean, essentially, even though the, the organs were removed, it was done carefully, like, nothing was damaged. It's yep. just, it's strange to me, the whole thing's very strange, like, who, the thought process of how this happens. So, okay, we have, um, the first official one's Marianne, now we're going into September 1st, so holy crap, this is moving quick now. So at first yep. was, if it is April 3rd as the first, possibly. Then we're in mm. August 7th, August 31st. Like, this has happened in weeks. Now we're in s- September 1st. So this person yep. murders and then turns around and murders again the next day. Like, literally, like, doesn't even care. Well, yeah. So it's September 1st and the 4th is when the police actually get really get involved and start questioning the prostitutes in the area, trying to figure out. And apparently this is where you get the theory of the la- uh, leather apron person who keeps popping up in their investigation in their questioning of people and everything so what was the what's behind the leather apron again is this just basically the nickname they essentially gave him in the beginning i th- i think so it was this a description of this man in the leather apron that was possibly like a um butcher and everything because i believe in the white travel you're close to the meat packing district and everything mm-hmm. so they this is where you get the theory of either it was a doctor or a butcher who would have been had the skill level to be able to do this precision. Mm-hmm. Because you have to think too, if you were a butcher, then they would have been able to cut open a body and remove the organs without doing damage. Because if you do damage to the organs, then you the damage rots. them. Right. Mm-hmm. Jesus, take the wheel. I want. So I'm sure that if it was the meat packing district, or if there were meat meat markets around, surely they investigated it. I'm assuming. So this is where, like I said, the, the leather apron person keeps popping up. So it probably someone who, this is what I find interesting because you have to think too that this probably is an area that everyone kind of knows everyone else in some way because it's like a dense neighborhood, few blocks if you look at the map. So everyone probably knew everyone else. So if they were mentioning this one person leather apron, then it might have been someone who was not a regular of that area that was popping up in their mind. Wow, 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 wow. So, which would, which to me, if we back up with what you were saying, theoretically, April 3rd, this Emma Smith is attacked and dies, could possibly be his first victim. It would make sense if this person wasn't from the area and they did take it slow, give themselves five months to really scope the area out, scope the people. And if it's small populated, certain people walk street walkers in those certain areas, same streets, I think they may have had victims already picked out, which that's also very common for serial killers as well. They slowly stalk their victims because there's a specific victim that they want, sometimes taking months and months to plan out their execution. And it's entirely possible, too, that he might have had already interacted with them at some level, too. Like, he might have talked to them went um, uh, went to the brothels or even just chatted with them. So they might have been interacting with the killer the whole time and not realizing it because mm-hmm. at the time they probably just thought he was just another person inquiring and everything. Maybe so, they did the devil's tango with him. Maybe. <laughs> right? Maybe he was a customer. Just it, saying. That's entirely possible. I mean, yeah. that's one of the theories of why he might have... And the thing is with the April 3rd one, um, I have to look up to see, I would have to double check to see what the Ripper Alters think, but it's one of those, like, they're still, it's still hesitant, just probably because it doesn't quite fit the, the same as the rest, Mm -hmm. but I could see this one might have been a moment of rage, like, interacting with this woman, and just raged out, wasn't really thinking or planning or anything, and it just didn't go quite right, and left, and then, like you said, since he was in regular area, he went back to really start kind of scoping out the air properly. Mm-hmm. Sounds like someone's in my in my studio right now. Like while you were talking, and I and no one's in here because I mean I have soundproof and then so I'm like it sounds like someone's ruffling through my things. I'm like, look, Jack. Nice <laughs> hey, Jack. How's it going? Why don't you give me your name so we can solve this shit after 200 years? Um, anyways, okay, so September 5th, 1888, the Star newspaper publishes a write-up on Leather Apron Serial Killer. So, once again, let's mimic, you know, Ted Bundy, 
we've actually seen with him speaking with the police and they have him on videotape talking about how he loved being publicized. So serial killers love that. They love to be like recognized of like what's going on. And then it probably gave him a little bit more soapbox to stand on, right? Don't you agree? You also have to think too here that these newspapers probably didn't exactly hold back on the details and everything. And that's uh, Ooh, one of the I didn't. I you're right. I didn't yeah, think they, about they that. They wouldn't hold back. Yeah. And like, even if some of them were like sketches, it'd be like all the the details and everything. So, Ooh, unlike wouldn't today, that be interesting to go to London and try to find original clippings of articles? Oh, that'd be awesome. Elfie's like, please let me go to the library and just just leave me there for days. <laughs> Jesus. Let me go to the archive. Oh my god, that would be amazing though, because it does make you wonder what was said. Like, but I would like to see the whole scope of them, not just like one. I want to see what all of them said during that time. Oh yeah, and and the thing, this is also where I was noticing with the research that this becomes the problem. Is is one of those? It's a good thing, especially for us. Sarah's like, uh, it's a good thing, what was that? especially. <laughs> For oh, babies. oh, is it? <laughs> you like tell your cat seriously? Can you just not yeah. during the stream, okay? <laughs> Jeez. Um, <laughs> I was just saying, um, this is where it becomes the good thing and the bad thing. Like, where on one hand, it's good for us that we get a lot of information from the newspapers mm. today from this. There's so much movement uh, in my office. I'm sorry, it's so oh bad. Oh my god. There's, like, cracking going on. Like, it sounds like someone's going through, like, my makeup drawers or something, honestly. And I, nobody's in here. Oh, wow. So I think I'd rather have a fur baby in my office than Jack the Ripper. Just saying. Anyway, um, go through my stuff. Like, hope you enjoy it. I don't know what you're looking for, but let me know if you find it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. So, I agree. Yeah, it becomes, like, like... You have the the press interviewing possibly the cops and whoever was at the scene, and that's the other thing. Like some of these scenes were pretty out in the open, so people seen seen all of this going on, and and they're just talking to people. And it's either how much of it is people saying they actually saw something, or people just like, hey, I'm going to be in the newspaper mm -hmm. and say whatever. So now you have people today trying to decipher how much is true and how much was it someone just winding that 15 minutes, honestly. Right, or did the press overly exaggerate like they do today? Yeah. I mean, there's so you could look at devil's advocate both sides. Like, was it accurate what they were saying? Were they saying more than they should have? Were they saying inaccurate details and, like, you know, making it look worse than it was, better than it was? Like, you don't know. But either way, I yeah, think that the publicity probably gave this killer, you mm -hmm. know, some excitement that, like, they felt famous. I was just thinking, too, like, there's an entire possibility, because I, I think I've heard of sometimes where, like, murders, like, will come back to the scene or will get close to the scene. Like, there's an entire possibility that the press could have interviewed Jack True. the Ripper without realizing they were interviewing Jack the Ripper. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, they could have been talking to him. He's like, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Such a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah. So, talk about uh, sociopath. I mean, that's a typical serial killer is a sociopath. And I could see him, like, depending on the, the person's character, it's like, they would be, I could see him, like, trying to push that line. Like, how far, how far can I get away with this? Right. I agree. Well, obviously, if you're capable of slicing and dicing a human being in pitch black, like... Mm -hmm. There is still, can you, Cat, can you hear it? Cat keeps saying it's loud, she can hear it. I can, it's just like, I mean, I would look behind my, my backdrop, but there's, I know nobody's in here. Like, when I'm streaming, my animals are locked out, my room is soundproof. It is like, I don't know. Oh, Jack. Hey, Jack, what's going on? Not normally your type, what can I do for you? Um... September, no, next one. So Leather Apron is this, which is such a, I mean, okay, I get it. It could be a butcher, but isn't that just so like, normally when you give a serial killer a name, it like, it's a rolling off the tongue sort of title. I feel like Leather, leather Apron is so like, <laughs> don't you think? Like, it's like, who did that? It sounds so cheesy. It's like cheese ball. You know what I mean? Also, like, I would think because they're probably close to the the workhouses and um, I'm not sure how close they were to docks and stuff. They were 
near working areas where there would have been people with le leather aprons. It wasn't like a highly unusual thing at all mm -hmm. in that day to have someone walking around with a leather apron. I know the butcher that was innocent was probably like, shit, I can't wear that out anymore because people are going to think I'm a murderer. Like, I was just wearing my attire, you know? I swear it's not human blood. <laughs> yeah, really. But how could you tell at that time? You probably couldn't, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, ugh. Well, Strange. Yeah. So, okay, uh, September 8th, Annie Chapman's found in the backyard. This is one of the worst ones, wasn't it? Uh, let's see. Annie, Annie Chapman. Chapman. She was found, like, um, in, like, a back back area that was off. Yeah, she was in a backyard area, which actually sounds like, that sounds a little more open. Like, instead of, like, in an alley or something, this is, like, this possibly shows that the the killer is getting even braver that they're doing it more out in the open of like, yep, I have done this thing. Right. And this person, she oh. was just like mutilated, they said. Um, mm -hmm. She, um, I, it was interesting because when I was doing my research too, I found, I'm sorry, my mom's dog just came over and he sings, so he's singing right now. So let's just, you know, wait it out until he's done singing because that's just what he does. He's like this huge terrier and that's how he greets my little tiny Aww. dogs. Um, hello, Astro, can you just stop for a minute and smile and everything's fine. I'm sorry, guys. You get to, uh, hear my dogs have an orchestra back there. Oh, for Jesus, take the wheel. It's gonna be fine. Anytime now. Anytime now. Okay, there we go, stop. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um... Oh, when I was doing my research, I found there's this group um, that's like, it's in London. So I'm not sure if they're paranormal investigators. I didn't dig into it enough. I found them on Instagram. Um, maybe I'll tag them on social media in case you guys want to follow them. But they're a group that does like tours and research in London area and like trace the steps of Jack the Ripper. And I thought that was really cool. So once again, I don't know if it's paranormal related. It might just be like a tourist thing related. Mm -hmm. But I thought that was really cool that someone's, that, like, that's a good thing to take advantage of. Like, that's a big thing that London's known for. And there's a lot of people that are horror fans and serial killer fans like we are. And I'm glad yep. someone took advantage of it and, like, did something with it. Um, and well, also, it's, it's a great, in some ways, like, they can go these places and not necessarily have to go into a building. They can be on the street area and right. still get that interaction. Exactly. Um, so Annie Chapman, I'm reading about her too. Mm -hmm. So, um, did, is she the one that had the children? I uh, don't. Let's see here. No, maybe. Oh, not. she was 47. Uh, where she was killed was nearby where she had been lodging for eight pence a night and double bed. Well, and of course they say that she had a she had a weakness for alcohol when she was young, and mm -hmm. so she was a drinker. So once again, I'd like to see the tabloids to see if, you know, tabloids are good at painting people in bad perspectives, mm -hmm. meaning the tabloid could have made her out to be like, oh, she's an alcoholic, she's a prostitute, she's dead, so what? You know, like that type of attitude. So it does make you wonder how it was sort of construed or how it was changed a little bit. Um, Might have, like, slanted it more towards, like, because some of the what's would talk about how it's like okay so the, you have these prostitutes who were like they only get so much money at night and are they going to spend it on lodging for that night or are they going to spend it on alcohol and, and it was just like wow we're just getting really dark here mm -hmm. so okay she is the one that was married so she was married to a guy named john james and she did have mm -hmm. three children with him so emily um and she had there was th two other kids i don't have John Alfred was another one, and John was born with, like, uh, disabilities, it says. Anyway, the reason I'm looking, because I'm like, okay, does this person have descendants still alive in the UK? It's entirely possible, yeah. See, that's the stuff that, like, I get obsessed with when you're like, okay, mm -hmm. this person may have descendants still and this is, like, crazy tragedy that's surrounding it, and it just, it makes you, it makes you think. I feel like when you hear stories like this, you forget, which is why documentaries are so important to me and why I love, like, filming documentaries. Because when you do something like this, you could bring in the descendants, whether it's, like, great-grandchildren, whatever. 
and you sit them down and talk to them about the events that took place with their ancestors and family, and suddenly now it's no longer a story, it's actually their real life. This actually happened. It's not just a serial killer. Like, this person traumatized this family, probably for generations and generations, and they're probably still in some ways dragging that trauma around from, from a certain degree, you know? Like, if someone's violently murdered like that, there's gonna be issues that arise one way or another. Well, it also shows that she she had had, to had run in with the police before with arguments and such. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree. It's where I think maybe in some ways this is why Jack the Ripper is such a fascinating case. Not just because it has not yet been solved, even though there's empty amount of books that have claimed they have solved the case. <laughs> I know, I hate years. that. That bothers me because like, I'll watch we documentaries. Have solved it. Yeah. Or they they promote it on social media like oh we went to we went to the UK and we solved the murder and we know who it was I'm like but do ya I really don't think you do um, like, so you have a theory yeah you have a possibility well I feel like there hasn't been enough done too like I told you I want to go to the UK and really dig up the files from like the archives of the police station and like I would love to like literally do a trip like a month long trip there and let's just see where the road takes us to leading us on the steps of Jack the Ripper. You know what I mean? And I, cause I know us, I know everything's haunted over there. I mean, it's old anyways, but especially anything related to this, I think with serial killers, sometimes they don't want to cross over because they're afraid to meet their maker. Is that how you feel when they, when crossing over happens? I've heard definitely cases where people have interacted with, um, hauntings and such, and they'll get EVPs of uh, the people who are possibly uh, there that they, they have a fear of they don't know what to expect on the next side, or like they're worried about judgment or something, especially if or they hell. were religious mm -hmm. when they were alive. Right, yep. So I'm interested in, I don't know, I feel like there could be more that could be done. That's all I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. So technically, Annie Chapman, so this was September 8th of 1888. Yep. Ooh, that's weird. So her death date was 9-8-1888. Ooh. Wow. That's numerology for you. I'd love to look <laughs> up the astrology chart on that date. That's all I'm going to say. I bet there's some weird stuff in there. But um, she was, so Annie was technically, technically, according to the police, the second murder victim. Only yeah. because she was also dissected. Yeah, because yeah, cause her murder was very similar. I, I think that's where it becomes a difficulty be with the one the cases before and the cases after. Like, how close are they to the same M.O.? Because if this is serial killer, we all know that they don't usually really stray away from their pattern. Like, change, it's, yeah, it's, change the way that they yeah. uh, choose death, I guess, is the way mm -hmm. to, yeah. They'll have consistent consistency of their victims, right? Oh, but yeah. it's almost there, like it's a habit that they have to do it this particular way or it's not right. It is, but you've even, so, you know, I don't know. Once again, I'm never, I never say never because I think that anything could happen. But you have heard Ted Bundy talk where he said he had a couple failed kidnapping attempts. He would mm -hmm. sometimes knock him in the head with like a sledgehammer or something. And he had a few of those that there were failed attempts. So it does make you wonder if there could have been failed attempts for Jack the Ripper? see that possibility. I mean, like I said, he... It's one of those, you're not sure how much is, it is that he chose this area because he felt that he could find victims that were not as traceable, or it was a ground that he felt like he could kind of disappear in and do what he wants. So I could see him uh, seeing them doing that where they could have made some tents or tried different things out, seeing what or they prefer. Or playing what devil's best. advocate again, maybe he killed someone and went to start the dissection and heard scuffling of people coming towards him, so he left the body. Yeah. He didn't have time. So, I mean, I'm not just saying, what if, yes, it could. I think it could happen, for sure. And maybe that's why the murders would get brood more brutal as they went on, because he would be upset that he didn't get to finish that victim or whatever, or like miss the boat on it, and he had to do something worse to the next one or something. 
also we have to remember too, like in this time period, the the police officers then aren't same as they are today. They weren't trained the same. They didn't have the same. They were oftentimes vol like volunteer that they didn't have the same schooling. It wasn't until you, it was mostly the detectives that did the really hard labor of trying to figure out who did it, but the people the 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 police you would see kind of walking the areas and checking things weren't really as trained up as they are today so they might not have been able to know what to look for compared to if you have a police officer today encountering the same things they would know what to look for well overlooking evidence could have happened another thing mm -hmm. that could have happened like consider the John Benet Ramsey case because I grew up in Colorado so that case was like kind of obsessive you know with everybody but when oh, yeah. John Benet uh, went missing before they went in the basement they found her body they didn't realize it for hours later that she was down there I have my own theories on that but that's for another stream <laughs> but um, like, basically they let uh, John Benet's family grew up in a city called Boulder so Boulder is mm -hmm. a very um, college town but it does have a lot of money so if you've lived in boulder most of your life there's a lot of big mansions it's kind of like uh the closest thing to a mountain town without being in the mountains i guess if that's a way to explain it and so the jean Benet case when it happened this family was very wealthy they lived in one of the most you know uh premier areas of the time and i think that the police saw them as a, an aristocratic sort of modern family and instead of locking down the house and doing a proper search and scope for evidence when they found her body, instead they just let everybody in and they trampled all the evidence. And that was part of the reason why they were never able to like pinpoint the murder of Jean Benet. And I, I feel bad because like they were blaming the brother and they were blaming the dad and the mom. I honestly, in my opinion, just because I grew up with that case, um, a lot of people want to br blame the brother. I don't think it was the brother. I think that the mom was, she had John Bonet in pageants. And I think that she would exchange her child to be sex trafficked for winning pageants. And I think that one of those people that was behind the pageants, who was obviously a pedophile, um, she must have had like a debt owed to them or something, took John Bonet in the basement and may have gotten a little too rough and then died. So I think that, you know, then you have Patty which is her mother, who ended up getting cancer later, and it was like a terrible form of cancer, and she died. So once again, it's that karmatic debt that comes back around to repay its debt in different directions. So same thing with this, but now you're talking 1888. You have police that haven't been trained formally, which, I mean, even to this day, mistakes still happen all the time. And they probably went in never seeing such a brutal, gruesome murder like this, didn't really know what to do, but then word gets out on the street that this person was like essentially dissected, more police come in, and they all just start trampling through the crime scene without paying attention to what they're doing, right? Is that, do, you, do you agree? No, I mean, you have police trampling the crime scene, you have neighbors, because you also have to remember this area, the area where these murders happen were densely packed, a lot of them were like, um, houses and taverns and just smushed together so you had a lot of people densely packed in these areas so if something happened everyone knows so people were checking out what was happening the police were checking out what was happening the press came and you have people walking around the bodies walking around the spot disturbing probably disturbing the body disturbing any possible evidence or anything around it just to get a look and see what was going on because especially at this point it was probably really catching steam and really becoming a big thing that everyone's like oh my god there's a killer in white travel there's a murderer and just like everyone just losing it well it's, people are still like that to this day if you think of like oh, yeah. driving down the highway and there's a car wreck it's on the mm -hmm. opposite side of the highway you don't need to slow down but everybody slows down because everybody's nosy everybody wants to see what's going on and it's like, so yeah, back then, I mean, it's still like that today, but back then, oh, I can imagine, especially when that type of murder was very, very rare, but everybody but wants to be a part of it and say they saw it. One. Right. Yeah. Well, it's also, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like a topic of conversation too, don't you think? Oh yeah. Everyone would have been talking about it, everyone. And that's the other problem you have to think too, is that 
you have this the crime scene you don't have them properly probably um uh roping it off making sure people don't walk through it but then you also have a lot of people talking to each other mm -hmm. so you don't i don't know if they had people new to like separate people and start interviewing going what did you see before they start chatting with each other and the story gets changed nor blown because you know once everyone starts talking to each other what they think they saw or what they knew they saw changes as well as the story kind of becomes a telephone game yeah i had i've watched this thing i can't remember what it was called it was on youtube a couple of years ago but um basically it was some criminal psychologists wanted to prove um, how people's brains work when trauma happens. So they basically brought in these volunteers. It was like five or six people, random people. There was a couple women, a couple of men, just, and there was like a kid and a teenager, like just a random group of people. They had them witness like a trauma, like, like a, there was a kidnapping that was an example. There was like a car wreck. There was like a domestic incident. And then when it was done, they like pretend it's a pretend thing, but the people that are witnessing it don't know that. So the police come in and they start interviewing these people about, hey, what did you see? Now we saw it because it's on videotape, right? So we know what was said, what, what you see. But what happens when trauma occurs, which is the criminal psychology part, is your brain thinks it saw something that it didn't see. So they would be like, how tall was the guy? Was he Spanish? Was he white? Like they would literally not give the right information. What, co what color shirt was he wearing? Was he wearing a hat? Was he wearing jeans? And they would not be able to depict what they just saw because trauma changes yeah. your brain. But you're right. Then you add in outside elements like discussing mm -hmm. it with neighbors and people. And now everything you think you saw, you didn't see. And I sort of feel like that's how the Salem witch trials went too, right? One yeah, person's a witch, about. everybody's a witch, hang everybody, just get rid of all of them. If you do any sort of witchcraft, just hang them. Well, also another good example of like evidence being contaminated is like if you look at the Lizzie Borden case and everything, when that happened, you had police and family and everyone just trampling through the house and going back and forth and and they were trying to collect stuff, but they weren't, but they were also talking and you also had the Borden family being this very influential influential family so of course you have to take into consideration oh we well we have to be very particular about this because they're well to do and everything and this all that aristocratic nonsense. once again yeah i agree yeah i don't the borden one's interesting too we we have to do a discussion on that but i there's a lot to unpack with the borden one for sure but one thing I don't like that's done, that's been brought up recently is there was a psychic that was a residential psychic. I don't know her name. I don't know who it was. So if anybody knows, let me know. But she, this was like three or four years ago, and she was um, like working out of the Borden house temporarily. And she came up with the theory that Lizzie Borden was essentially molested by her father, and that was why she murdered her stepmom and dad. And I remember paranormal investigators ran with it mm. and they started accusing the Bordens of molesting their daughter. And like, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't just take one piece of information that a psychic said and run with it. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm not saying it did happen. I'm just saying that they're not here to defend themselves. And that's an interesting theory to come up with, you know, a hundred and something years later. I mean, yeah, I mean, one thing if they found it in a journal or a letter or some sort of evidence from the family themselves that something had happened, but if a psychic's like, I'm getting a message that this was a thing, so one was like, we'll take note of it, but not run with it as if it is exactly. fact. Well, and then people started going in and investigating in the house, accusing the Bordens of doing it. And then there was dark stuff that started happening in the Borden house. And I just didn't agree with it. And that's where I feel like we have a responsibility. All my lights just went out in my office, by the way. So that's interesting. Uh, that, now Lizzie's like, hey, what's up, girl? I'm, I feel you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's come join Everybody, the party. hey, guys, just come on in. You know, you just bring it on in. No, but, like, it is, it's a responsibility <laughs> as paranormal investigators to make sure that, you know, you're right, take note of it. But, like, yeah. Where are you? Did the information come from a spirit box? It, there was something else that just fell. I don't know if you heard that. Oh, gee. 
Anyway. Well, I mean, this is this should be information that should be no doubt, and then you should like go to historical place, go do research to see if there's any actual verification of it. Because mm -hmm. until it can be actually verified, it's like yes, you were told this, but I can't say that this is fact. This is a theory or allegedly, but not like unless I see it in a letter or journal that this happened. This is just a psychic saying they got this message well and there's also you know with jack the ripper case there's alleged list of possible murderers but once again it's not infinite there wasn't dna testing back then we don't know is it fair to go in these haunted locations and just start accusing this specific name person it's not fair like would you want your name slandered 100 years after you were gone is basically what i'm saying like as i'm just reaching out to the paranormal community you're responsible for this you know even if you're just making a documentary you put on youtube please be mindful of what you're putting out there because these souls could be trapped here still and they may not even be the murderer but like let's not just point the finger because i feel like that's you can't we don't have any infinite sort of... There's still people that are in prison to this day that are now being released because DNA is proving that they are not... They weren't the murderer. So I just feel like as a paranormal investigator, we have a very big responsibility. And it needs to be done with grace and poise rather than just accusations. Well, that... And also you have to think, too, it's like a lot of the urban legends or folklore that we... Um, end up getting at haunted locations half the time are usually hearsay or stories that just a tour guide or a someone in the tour or someone makes a comment and it just filters down and then somehow a long way it becomes canon and so there, that's the other things you have to be aware of is that if you're putting this like on a documentary or in film you have to be very specific of like what this information is or where it stands as the whole of the case because at some point it could end up in a book on yet yeah, like yep yeah, this was a thing this actually happened when it was just literally they spotted it in a blurb and that was it well you could even go to change it off of that honestly you could even say if the psychic got the information i'm not questioning the psychic okay but what if it was Lizzie Borden saying, oh yeah, my parents molested me. They didn't really, but she wants people to think that. So what you just, I'm not saying the psychic's lying per se, but do be careful and take that information with a grain of salt. But where they're but you obtaining that- you can have a spirit saying whatever. Like you can have a spirit saying all sorts of nonsense right. and everything. And it's like, I'm sorry, just because a ghost told you something does not mean it's the gospel truth. It's true. And even if it's the psychic that's basically the channeler, I have a perfect example for that, which is when we filmed um, our pilot document documentary that is winning all these awards, by the way, holler, holler, we've won so many awards, awesome. I'm so proud of all of us. <laughs> um, sorry, I had to like toot my own horn for a sec, but um, well, for example, we were on set at a haunted location in Arizona that was um, originally Native American grounds, I was very... Uh, passionate about it because I'm Native American and I wanted to tell the story uh, in a way that they weren't able to. And so we thought that we were, you know, we did the history, man. Like we knew what we were talking about. We dug, we did the history. But when we showed up to set to actually investigate all of the EVPs and especially like spirit box activity wasn't even the natives. It wasn't even the people from the tribe. It was people that, and it wasn't even of the time, there was a war on the ground. There, were, there was an actual war between like the United States government and native tribe. It wasn't even that. It was construction workers that had come in afterwards that were miners. That's who we connected with. So you have to be open-minded is what I'm saying. And you also have this responsibility as an, a paranormal investigator, if you're running your crew especially, is that you might go in thinking you know everything and you might come out with a completely different story through the spirit box. Like, let the spirits tell their story. You And once yeah. again, with a psychic, too, be careful. because I, And I'm not saying not to believe the psychics. I'm just saying that I would believe more if it came through the spirit box or EVPs versus through a channeler. 
Well, my worry, honestly, because with uh, psychics and working with... Because I do like the idea of like working with psychics in case, but um, what my worry comes is the whole front-loading information. So if you have a psychic walk through and they're saying all these things about this place, this spot's on, and this spot's on, and someone died over here, and someone died over there, and you're they're just kind of front-loading everyone. So when now, when the investigators come through and they're like, oh, this rooms haunted even if there was any any it wasn't a actual historic evidence but because they just got the haunted tour essentially from the psychic now all they can think of is like this room must be haunted just these haunted like, spots so. yeah yeah and you're only focusing on these haunted spots i agree mm -hmm. like it's okay to do that do hot spots that's good but if you're not getting yeah. anything move on to something else mm -hmm. like it's true to say that Psychics are not... I would never expect a psychic to be 100% perfect and accurate every time. That's an inaccuracy. They are still humans, and the channeled message could still come through not correctly. That doesn't yeah. make them any less of a real psychic. It's just that they're still human interacting on a different level. And I, I agree. You should not take everything they say and only focus on those places because you could be missing a really big op opportunity in a completely different location that they didn't even point out where that's actually most of the hot, you know, the hot spot for paranormal activity. I totally agree with you on that, 100%. Elfie's like, drop the mic, I'm done. Okay. No, I mean, like, for me, like, I like the idea of using psychic walkthroughs and we, we use them on our show and everything. But what was good was actually keeping them kind of separate where they, you didn't get, the investigators didn't get front loaded. And even actually, it was good that the clients didn't get front loaded because the clients hear all this stuff and they're like, oh my goodness, this room is so haunted now. It's like, you just heard the psychic say it. Was it haunted <laughs> before they came through it? Oh my god, I love it. Elfie's like, why are you scared? Literally, I was watching, I'm going to just say it the other day. I don't care because I feel like it. I was watching um, an episode of Dead Files. This was like, what, two weeks ago I texted you about it? Yeah. And I can't remember the episode. It's a newer one. I know that. But it was like some sort of like haunted farmhouse or like, or like, I don't know. It's always the farmhouses. Yes, isn't it? It's always the farmhouse. It's house. always the middle nowhere farmhouses <sighs> that are the most haunted. Yeah, like, what kind of Ed Gein weirdo are you out there hanging out in a damn barn? You know what I mean? But whatever. You don't want to cross over? No, you want to hang out in this weird, crappy, old, abandoned barn? Okay. I guess go for it. Um, I, I, have other <laughs> I have better things to do, Ed. Okay. <laughs> um... But no, uh, there was an episode of Dead Files, and, and you know, I've talked a couple of things about Dead Files. I don't necessarily discount Amy Allen, okay? Yeah. I don't. I've never met her in person, so I don't know. I'd have to meet her in person and see how it goes, okay? Mm -hmm. I have discounted the producers on there, though, because I do think the producers make her say and do certain things to convey a certain way, which you have to because it's a television show, right? Like... They are about they need a visual. They yep. need some visual to yep. look at. <laughs> Little dramatic on the spooky side, whatever. But this episode I watched a couple of weeks ago. Um, she was in this haunted barn. It was a newer episode, and um, they're sitting down at the end. You know how they're like, okay, I did a sketch of the demon in your house or whatever. And you're like, okay, let me see what the demon looks like. You know, whatever. So they're doing all this chat, and then now we're at the end of the discussion. So, and clearly it was probably haunted. I don't discredit that these people are real. I don't discredit the locations are real. But the way she handled it was, like, god-awful. So basically they're sitting at this table, and she's like, okay, this is what, you know, you have to do. You have to get a shaman from the Cherokee Nation. They have to be under 16 years old, and they've had to be a registered nurse for at least 12 years. Like, she always hey, gives what? these unrealistic expectations of how you cleanse Those your house. That's specific. It is. It is. And you, you like, like, literally. You have someone on speed dial already we could use? <laughs> it's, it's like these people are like, where am I going to find one? Like, I don't know. Like, how am I going to find a 16-year-old shaman? She always gives these unrealistic expectations, but... This was different. She did give unrealistic expectations to how to get rid of it, but she basically told these people that her house was in their house was infested with demons and that they their ultimate goal was to take over their bodies and souls and kill them. She said that at the table. 
And you're looking at this family who it's like a man and a husband or a husband and wife and then their kids, I don't remember, two or three kids, whatever it was. The kids aren't there, obviously, thank God. But these people just start crying and breaking down because they think that the demon is going to take over their body and that it wants to eat the soul. And now they're like, what? Oh, my God, let's just give up on life and just like take my soul now because I'm just done dealing. It's they're crying. And it's just that's the problem that I have is the fear. Do you agree with me on that? Oh, Lord. <laughs> The fear. They want to eat your soul. Okay, thanks. Have a good day. <laughs> I can't, Alfie. Oh my god, that was one of your one-liners. Yes, I love when we catch those on camera. Oh, uh, it is. It's, it was, it's no. I mean, okay. I understand. Okay, on one hand, I understand if a medium has a message and they feel they need to convey it to the people. First, they need to ask, like, can I convey this? But you don't outright go like, there are infestations of these demons. They're going to eat your soul. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> She's like, they're gonna, they want to devour your soul and take over your body, and they, and like these people are just mourning. I mean, like, like clearly they're scared. Yeah. They're obviously there's paranormal activity. I'm not questioning that, but now they're just like bawling their eyes out and they feel hopeless. And I'm like, it's there's just a bad. way to deal with things, and that's not the way. now. Once again, do I think that was authentically from her? No. I think it was probably persuaded by the producers to make it dramatic effect. But now you have these people, this couple living in this barn who are like traumatized and think they need to just demolish the whole thing and like leave the country, you know, like to get because I, mean, I feel like something that that drastic and that horrifying, it'd be like. One, please do that off camera and <laughs> explain them and say, like, this, just, we're just going to drop this whole thing I'm in front of you. I'm just going to drop a bomb on you. They want to eat your soul. Like, Jesus. And then just pack up and leave and be like, okay, we feel like this might be happening, but we already have on call someone to come in to cleanse and everything. No, and but they don't. Help. They don't, ha they don't call people like, in to help them. She gives them the expert, like, who they have to find. And you're just kind of like. Oh man, now these people think these demons are going to eat them. Which, by the way, I don't agree with that statement. I don't think that no. can happen. You'd have to be in a severe state of oppression and possession for that to occur. And you'd be, like, throwing up pea soup at that point. So, and I'd be calling they were hoping a they were preacher. Like, oh, they, they were hoping it was Casper or something. They didn't expect <laughs> something like the, the bowels of hell were opening up in their barn. I'm crying. I just can't. No, but that, that's, once again, as a paranormal investigator, we have a responsibility. Which is why... Mm -hmm. I think with Ghost Girl Diaries, we want to be authentic and we want to bring authentic, you know, cases and facts to the table and, and also play devil's advocate because I think that's almost more interesting than putting on, like, the Hollywood facade. That and also, like, I know at times, especially if you do bring a psychic or medium onto a case, the, the families oftentimes do want to talk to them, do want to get their inside and everything and that's when I feel like investigators one they need to find out okay what does the second want to tell them to kind of like figure out what to go but also the investigators play mediator to make sure that true that the the family's not freaked out because it's more like we are saying you want to talk to the psychic we're, we're going to let you but we're going to do it off to the side here we're going to mediate to make sure you understand what's going on and not just like oh my god what's going on well, yeah, but then when you make people cry and scream and get scared and upset like that, they're creating more electromagnetic fields, which are in turn creating more energy for this thing to manifest, whatever it is. And it's now there's going to be even more paranormal activity, and it's almost like that's like, what they want. It's like, hi, you have this infestation, good luck. Now, now you're expecting them to be able to sleep in this place afterwards? I know, I know. It breaks my heart because it's... Because it, hauntings are legit, you know? And honestly... Mm -hmm. The only message I've ever had is just remembering to take your power back in your own house. If you have your if your house is haunted, mm -hmm. you have something happening. I mean, I don't like the sage gatekeeping thing, so I'm not even going to go there. But uh, sage the damn house, get some crystals, find some St. Michael, you know, pendulums, put them in four corners, north, south, east, west. Uh, you know, put a salt ring around your house and sage that shit out, and then you're done. And you have to deal, you know what I mean? Like, take your house back. So, people like are so created by fear because of the paranormal activity. It's like, dude, your ghost doesn't pay rent, bro. So, like, decide who's going. I think this is also, I, I feel like this is something that is not really drilled in enough when it comes to uh, 
groups of investigators when they want to do private cases. Because it's one thing if you want to do a public place where it's like a big place where you don't need to worry about a client necessarily you're, because it, it's fine. But when you're dealing with families and private homes, half the job is not even investigating. Half the job is trying to build up the family and help them, like you said, regain power of the house and mm -hmm. trying to help them understand what's going on to either explain that it's natural uh, occurrence or if it is paranormal how they can do something with it and because it's half time you have to explain to them like we can't be with you 24 7 mm -hmm. but we can help you work to either clear this out or at least set ground rules mm -hmm. so that's half the work with the investigators is to basically help build them up and not say that the demon is going to devour your soul. Jesus, yeah, don't do that. take the don't wheel. Uh, if anyone ever tells you that, you need to get them out of your house immediately. <laughs> like, it's just not as safe. You know what I'm saying? Just. So, if you want the house cleansed, I would honestly, I would prefer the investigators, like, most of the time, if they have someone on hand, like, they have someone on speed dial where they're like, okay, they're in this area. We know someone who can come in and cleanse because we have a working relationship, not like, okay, we're going to let you Google the first person that comes up and mm -hmm. hopefully they won't, like, I don't know, charge you an arm and leg to cleanse your house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or do it incorrectly or put a hex mm -hmm. on you or something, for God's sake. Yeah, because you're expecting to know what to look for and, and what type of person to cleanse the place and, and not get scammed or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if a demon can devour your soul, though. I mean, I think that take that that you're a little ways off of that. You know what I'm saying? I highly doubt you it. You have to go through I some don't. oppression, then some possession, then you got some it's, Emily it's Rose shit. Thing. Then you're there. You know what I mean? Like it's gonna be a minute. Like I feel like like you act like it's gonna happen tomorrow. Well, also, if if the case didn't show anything with the clients to begin with, that there, there wasn't any unusual activity with them, any oppressive signs or anything of that nature then it's like yeah it's not instantaneous oh it's any moment makes me tired makes me tired <laughs> people make me tired <laughs> okay so back like, to oh. um but anyway the point of that rant is it's a point which is be yeah. responsible as a paranormal investigator you have you you know even if you're putting stuff online be responsible with what you're placing out there because People will, it'll turn into a gimmick, and you don't want to become a gimmick. You don't want to become a sellout. We need an episode alone of just what not to do in ghost hunting. <laughs> Which Kelsey, is going to be I a could two just hour go rant. on for 400 years on that. I think you and I both could. <laughs> like, let me tell you what I experienced, okay? Um, oh, man. Okay, so back to Jack the Ripper. So we're going to, like, skip forward here. So um, yeah. Elizabeth Stride um, was found in September 30th of 1888. So whoever this is, these are all, like, the official killings. These are, like, happening really quickly within a matter of a couple of months. Literally, it started basically August 1st, or if you're talking official cases. And yeah. all of these are prostitutes, women. There's the next one, September 30th, 1888. Catherine. Um, so these were both done on the same day, essentially. One was at 1 a.m. Yeah. and one was at 1.45 a.m. This was also in Whitechapel. And this, this one is actually the interesting one where, like, before that, on September 27th, the Central News had gotten the, the boss letter, which essentially was the where the title Jack the Ripper comes from and everything. That, that's because before then, I believe they were just calling it the White Trap, Whitechapel Murders or Whitechapel Stabbings. Mm -hmm. So this is where the, the, the newspaper were like, hey, this is an even cooler name. Let's go with this instead. Jesus Lord. Yeah, October 1st, 1888 is when the police officially name him Jack the Ripper, and it's basically made public. And then by October 6th, it's spreading through news agencies like wildfire. Yep. So with September 30th, you, this is where yeah, it was I just at. heard a male voice in my ear. I don't know what he said. Oh, no. You come on. Dude, on. dude, dude. I will sage you out, mofo. Okay. He'll do it too. I He'll will. I will salt rim this house. Don't even play me, okay? Uh, it was in this ear. If you guys heard anything, let me know. But come on. Look, I you know that tells you that this is like this dude does not want to cross over, and he finds ways to transmute through energy, and he's like, yes, people are talking about me. Let's like show him how much power I have, and like, oh, I'm creepy. Yeah, we knew. 
We already yeah. knew you were creepy, you know, by removing women's organs. Why? What's wrong with you? What did your mama do to you? What happened to you? That's sick. Okay. All right. Sorry. So, Elizabeth Stride uh, was murdered in Burner Street uh, at 1 a.m., but then Catherine Eddowes was murdered on Wider Square, City of London, at 1.45. And they... This is where a lot of people suspect that um, Elizabeth was murdered. Same, similar stuff, throat slash uh, organs taken and everything. Uh, but it wasn't quite as grisly. Like, they, it showed, like, almost like an interruption. Mm -hmm. So this is a possibility, like, someone had come by or the police had come by and someone had interrupted his ritual, essentially. Mm -hmm. So then they leave and they find another person Catherine Eddowes and they just basically finish what they started and go like a step further essentially I think I wonder if this is the one where I was talking about with the nose cut off and everything there was a nose cut off yeah it this was like in my house right now. What's wrong with you? carving into the face don't touch people's faces you're nasty God. like this, this here. I didn't know that one was that Catherine? Yeah. Ugh. Let me see if that was Catherine. Because I want to say it was. This is when you definitely got where it was not just now the organ; it was just going everywhere. So he was and just like slaughter. Oh, that's right. His last victim was like Mary Kelly, right? And she was found mm -hmm. like completely, just like almost cut in half, right? Oh, yeah, the picture is, like, it takes you the moment, really, to... Yeah, Catherine Eddowes was the one where it, where uh, Jack the Ripper was now carving the face up, too. What is... Ew. Because there's a newspaper clipping showing what her face looked like before and then what it looked like after, and her nose was dropped off, and I think there was a stabbing under the eye. Did they find the and, nose? Was it, like, on the scene? I'm assuming so. I'm sure if they ever found the news. Makes you wonder, oh, though, if he did keep, if he was removing organs, if he did keep something for, like, uh, like, trophy, because that's a very serial killer thing to do. Yeah. Is keep something for trophy, like, oh, this is the nose of Catherine. Like, how, what are you doing? Who does that? Entirely possible, because I believe they said she was missing a couple of kidneys. A couple? You only have two, yo. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I mean. She was missing her kidneys. <laughs> Well, I think, I'm not sure if it was any other organs, but I think it was definitely the kidneys. I don't know if she was missing a liver or anything, but the kidneys were not accounted for. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Well, then it makes you wonder if there was, like, some black market shit going on. Like, was he, like, you know what I mean? Trading it for, like, someone needs a kidney. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. Uh, I Actually, I think it was more they thought there was possibly cannibalism going on and oh, not so much Oh, Jesus Lord. I'm going to have to sage for God's sake. Yeah. What's wrong with All you? All the same thing. Got issues, man. October uh, 6th, the letter from hell comes in, which is where... All right. I can hear you in here. All right? It's getting louder. And it's so, just... yeah, the letter from hell comes in with half the liver, and I believe this is where the, the person, uh, whoever wrote the letter claims that they had enjoyed the other part of the the liver, uh, not other part of the kidney. So it was half a kidney, and they possibly ate the other half. Right. Because you couldn't afford a steak or something, right? And it's like, so we went from just mutilation to now cannibalism, which is actually kind of a big leap, honestly. It's one thing where you have the murder killing, but the thing is, you're not sure, like, we're not sure, like, was there any other signs of parts missing with the other victims? Or was this really did the first time? Did they look enough? That yeah, I mean, had. did they look enough? It makes you wonder. Mm -hmm. Like, did they take account of everything, or was there pieces, many like pieces of flesh, organs, anything? It's just nasty. So November 9th of yeah, 1888, quite... we have our last like major victim, basically, which is Mary yeah. Kelly. She's found dead in her room, which is on 13 Miller's Court. Um, and she was just absolutely like vengeance mutilated. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. This and this is, is... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, this is what is interesting, because you have to think, too, that photography was still a pretty new thing. Like, it was not a very... Com it was 
more utilized now at, at that point than it was when it first came out, but it wasn't as used. So it, it's fascinating also to see these photographs that are still quite, were quite expensive to do of the crime scenes. Well, yeah, wasn't depicted. it the kind of like camera where you almost had to put like a cloth over you to like be dark mm -hmm. and like you stand behind it on like a tripod thing? And yeah, they were really it was really bulky. Yeah, it was the big box ones, and you had to open up, and they had to, to wait, like, I don't know, 30 seconds or something to get enough light, and then they closed it up, and you didn't want it exposed or anything. It had the, the lead plates and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely much more involved than what we know for Tark Free today. Mm -hmm. So but there yeah, were other murders after Mary Kelly, but they weren't able to totally say that... Mm. It was them. So there was one girl named Rose who was found strangled not far from the same area. Mm. Um, what does it say that says it may have been self-inflicted? How do you self-inflict a strangulation? Like, choke yourself? They think that she was drunk and that she was so drunk that she be, like pretty much uh, clotheslined herself without oh. realizing it and God strangled. Damn. Jesus. That she was apparently blind drunk and that she just clotheslined herself. Shit. I hope she went to sleep and that was it. Um, then Alice was found in a castle alley of Whitechapel again, mm -hmm. um, but it was also less violent. Um, detectives still believe it was the Ripper. But see, this yep. point, you know, this person's getting so much headway and, like, publicity that this is when you have to start worrying about copycats. Yeah. Oh, Yeah. And But the thing is, with the difference between, like, with Mary Kelly, if you look at that case and, and how grisly it was and just, like, unfortunately, like, just how much it was, the she was this t torn apart, it makes some sense because it's in a room, it's much more private, there's no one to interfere, there's no one to bother, so it was almost like this was the perfect time where he could really just they could really just go to town and not See, now be that interrupted. particular one makes me wonder if it was a like quote customer for the prostitution mm. because how did she get alone with him at 1 a.m in a, in a random room and if yeah. i remember some of the stories i've read correctly on mary kelly it was like more of like a upscale room that she was staying in and it was one that they didn't think she'd be able to afford by herself for the night so you're right. Okay. Was he scouting them by like sleeping with them as a customer? I can see that, especially like she got a whole room to herself. When most of the time, when people got a room, it was more like you got a space on the floor or a bed stacked with a bunch of other people. That was your room for the night. So to actually have a whole room to yourself, that costs quite a bit. Now they have a f ton of possible suspects which is just ridiculous to me because I feel like this isn't narrowed down at all you know like there's like literally 10 suspects that are possible on this list and to me that says like proper investigations just were not done like how do you come up with it yeah it's huge like it's a that's, lot of that's how you like everyone it, it basically wealthy white Victorian man who lived around that time was a suspect essentially it's a damn mood still that way in Hollywood sometimes you know what I mean like the wealthy white men I mean which is also true though think about it if he was shopping prostitutes only wealthy white men would have been the ones to afford it at least on a regular basis yeah right well yeah if, if he was shopping these specifically yeah absolutely also, I could see, like, if he was dressed nicely and was presentable, he would probably have more matched what they would be looking for in customers, so he wouldn't have, mm -hmm. if he, he wouldn't have stood out to them. He, he would just have been blending in as the next person and nothing unusual, like, oh, my next customer and everything. Which, so, if he was a surgeon or a doctor or whatever, he mm -hmm. would have had the money for that easily to dress up, and it wouldn't have been a red flag. He just thought it was a rich white guy looking for a good time for the night. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting to go down this. So, there's Walter Sickert. Is that right? Is that how you say it? He yep. was a painter. So, he basically yep. gave the image of what the killer may have looked like on the outside. But, once again, never proven. Mm -hmm. um, another guy named George Chapman, who was arrested for the murder of a couple of his wives in 1903, right? 
Yep, he, he basically, he came to London and everything, he remarried uh, at least a couple of times, and just then there was this, I'm reading over a string of like, married this one, and then she dies. Married this one, and then she dies. Married this one, and then that she dies. That was so and common oh, back way. then, though, because you could go get, like, cyanide from the pharmacy and, like, slip it in their food mm-hmm. and all other, you know, ingredients. They had the poison rings, like, women even did it to their husbands, and they didn't have toxicology back then, so it was just like, oh, he died of in his sleep from unknown circumstances. Nobody really knows. Oh yeah, no, you you uh, back then you could get a hold of a lot of different <laughs> narcotics and poisons quite easily at the apothecary, and no one would have thought twice about it, mm-hmm. honestly. No, because they used it for, there. I mean, I think it was cyanide. I don't remember. It might have been cyanide they used to dye dresses green. Yeah, because I learned about that in fashion. I want to say cyanide was also used as ingredient for possibly cleaning too. Yeah, I think it was, and for to dye dresses green, whoever mm-hmm. was stitching the dresses as the seamstress, their hands would start to melt off, and the yeah, women it, would wear the dresses, and they would say, "You can't wear it for longer than six or eight hours at a time, because it'll mm-hmm. make you sick." But they would still wear it. It's like holy crap, because the green was un- unobtainable at that time from like. Uh, actual dyes they didn't like they haven't figured it it's just crazy so yeah it was you... this vibrant green emerald color and there was uh, i'm trying to remember there was another color that made like a blue but it was a poison that you that oh lead i think lead, lead could yes make very vibrant colors mm-hmm. on both in cloth and also on wallpaper well and, and only the wealthy could afford that as a dye for their clothing so they would mm-hmm. want to wear it because it made them look like the aristocrats so it's like, yeah, but you're going to die breathing it in. You know what I'm saying? But whatever, I guess. Um, another convicted suspect was a guy named Aaron uh, Kamashki, I think is how you say it. And he was in, he was convicted or they suspected him in the um, 1890s. But he died in 1919. And he was in an asylum. But I don't yep, know, man. Was, Even if you're in an he asylum. He was one of the few actually the investigators actually had suspected and everything. This isn't just like later on people throwing darts at the wall this was actually in the investigation but then he was basically in and out of asylums from the 1890s till his death he spent like the last 25 years in one asylum and everything That's but crazy. they never could quite nail it down that it was him well and remember too back then first of all people didn't live as long mm-hmm. second of all asylums if you got syphilis you'd be put in an asylum so it wasn't necessarily like you were crazy or had some mental illness Sometimes you were just really sick from like weird things, and they'd have they'd have nowhere to place to put you, so you'd have to yep. go in there. So it was, a lot of people with syphilis, you did eventually go crazy, but they would let mm-hmm. you live there until the syphilis started like attacking your brain membranes and stuff. Oh God, it's crazy. Um, um, there's another guy named uh, John Durette who is also a convicted suspect, um, mm-hmm. and he committed suicide um, by jumping into a river. Yep. So I, now this, this was one of the big ones that a lot of people talk because after he committed suicide and everything, it was um, the murder stopped. But a lot of people believe that when he was suspected, um, I'm trying to remember, he had a pretty um, good job and everything. I'm trying to remember if he was an accountant or something. And uh, when it came out that he was a suspect, he was released from his job and they believe that's actually what caused him to jump and everything well you can play victim's advocate with that too either he felt so guilty and didn't want to go to prison so he jumped Mm -hmm. or you know the it's once again that game of telephone and you know salem witchcraft where when one person accuses you everyone looks at you and you might have been innocent and he probably may have thought well my i might as well just end my life because even if I'm oh, yeah, proven the- not guilty, I might as well just kill myself. You know what I mean? So it was it was kind of a sad time to live in because obviously all ten of these people. Do you think there were more than one murderers? I don't think there were. I think there was one person responsible. I kind of always wondered that if it was possible. I mean, if, if it was possible, one person could do it because it would make more sense it'd be solo because they would have to approach the woman and probably made it seem like they're they're wanting services and make some offer this is probably also why maybe there wasn't as much struggle or the struggle was very minimum because they were just 
not thinking that there was trouble right, right. until it was too late. Right. But if you had two people coming up to you, then that would have been much more uh, red flags coming up and everything. Uh, the other thing could be if they did have someone working with them, they could have done it, helped them afterwards mm -hmm. to move the body or to help them with the cleanup or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I mean, for sure, there had to have been one particular person that was actually the knowledgeable one behind the anatomy. I feel like finding two people that were capable of that's a really that's a far stretch, in my opinion. Especially back yeah. then, you would have had to have only one person that was really that knowledgeable to make those precise cuts, not damage any mm -hmm. of the organs, remove the organs in the dark. Like I don't know, maybe he had an assistant that would like watch out for. You know, there are other options yeah. of, of other placements, but. To think that two people were responsible for the cutting, I don't. I think that's highly unlikely, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Prince Albert was um, also basically. Uh, this was Annie's like boyfriend or something, right? Or yeah, no, this was the, he, he got one. he got the prostitute pregnant, right? And that was why he yeah. was put under the microscope. Oh yeah, this was the unusual one. Uh, this actually, if you ever read the comic book From Hell, written by Al Moore, I believe this is the. The main theory that he uses for his story and everything mm -hmm. but yeah it was this idea that he was a wild guy he visited brothels he possibly got um a shop girl and pregnant because he was in that area and then the royal family needed to cover it up mm -hmm. because we don't want a scandal or mm -hmm. illegitimate child on our hands or anything and so they believe that this is possibly what could have started chain reaction of uh, these these women being murdered because they knew that they talked to Annie and they, they were in the know of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Well, and this was also what the movie From Hell with Johnny Depp was based off mm -hmm. of was this theory. I like that movie as well. Um, yeah. Basically, like, Mary uh, Annie gave up the baby to Mary Kelly Mary Kelly supposedly had the baby for a while, and it was supposed it, if this is real, that Mary Kelly, before she was murdered, handed the baby off to some sort of an orphanage. So if this is real, someone out there is of blood lineage, and they're going to find out eventually through ancestry DNA. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> eventually. They, they, they might find out they're the illegitimate child of from the royal family and have, like, a more direct line to the throne uh -huh. <laughs> than anyone. <laughs> and the prince obviously slept with prostitutes. He did end up getting syphilis. He was put in an asylum and died from syphilis, which is sad. What they, they think possibly happened. They they say allegedly. It's, allegedly. it's never been, like, confirmed, but it's what was rumored. Mm -hmm. Once again, though, bringing in the royal family into light of the power and money that could play into possibly removing people out of their way and becoming, like you said, a scandal essentially well you also have to think like this would be even more so because this was still queen victoria was still around mm -hmm. and the the royal family had even i think probably even more power than they do I, i'm not sure how much power they have today but they they had a quite a lot of power with queen victoria time so they could really get things covered up if they needed things just to go away mm -hmm. well i think they can still do that for sure um, like, Lewis Carroll is another one. Um, that was just the weirdest one. Yeah, what is it? You, I'm going to let you explain this one, because this one I found strange. This one I've heard before uh, in the, the long list, and this apparently there, I need, now I just need to find this book, because there's apparently a book out uh, called Jack the Ripper, Lighthearted Friend by Richard Wallace that came out, I believe, in the early 90s. And I'm like, okay, now I need to find this book. Oh my God. And he believed that Lewis Carroll, the Reverend Charles Dodson, was his real name, was Jack the Ripper. And if you read his books, which I want to say the books were published before this. Yes, the books were published before this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there wait, was wait, okay. Ooh. So, wait, okay. The books were published before this, so then how do yeah. we come to the conclusion of it? It's just theory, mysterious theory, or or. He thought there was like if you if you decipher the books, then 
it would show his plans to do this. It's, it's like, like a, wait. it's like a secret. What? It's like a secret. It like, uh, how do you explain this? Do you guys remember the old books, like in like, um, when we were in grade school, like '90s era, where you would like read a book and it would like choose which passage, and then you flip to page oh. thirty-eight or four. That's what it seems like to me. Where it's these yeah, like, encrypted books, messages in the books, which led to him being like the admitted. Um, it was their own story. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I mean. Yeah, because the books were published in 1865. That's what I remember. Yeah. So the Alice in Wonderland was published in 1865. So it was like a precursor of what he was going to do in 15 years. So safe to say, no one really in the Ripperology kind of believes this. They're just yeah. like, yeah, sure, because like one of the passages, like uh, when Alice is with the Duchess who's all about the pepper and everything mm -hmm. and she picks up the squalling baby and at some point the baby turns into a pig and she walks off with the, the pig baby and everything he thought that was somehow a message somewhere in there of his intention right like it the butcher like, like the apron the butcher or like the cutting out the uterus type of thing like yeah yeah it's one of those like Okay, I, I, it's like one of those, like, it's not even a matter of, like, squinting and lurking sideways. It's more like, I don't see it. I don't know how you saw it. I don't, I don't know. But okay, good luck. Yeah, I will, yeah. once again, you have to take into account that I really think that the person had some sort of anatomy background, which means they were a doctor or surgeon. That's the only thing that makes sense to me at that time. Which wouldn't have worked with Luz Caro right. because he was a an mathematician. Author. Right, well, and an author. Right, yeah, wrote book. So, what? Yeah, like... 2 plus yeah. 2 equals 68? I don't think so. Like, but okay. But that's once again <laughs> one of those far-fetched things, sort of like the H.H. H. Holmes thing of like, okay, well, the stories kind of line up, but then again... Mm -hmm. uh, now, there was a doctor, Dr. Thomas Neal. So yeah. he was executed for another um, unrelated murder. But it, Which I think was a book uh, that came out recently more about him. So his final words before persecution were, I am Jack the Ripper. I do, Are you... Do we, are you sure? Do you just want to I mean, be? That might have been a little garbled at that point. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, whatever. So, but I mean, he's oh. a doctor, so maybe he just wanted to take that to the grave. I don't know. To me, well, that also, sounds far fetched. Wouldn't too. Match up. Also, his Emma wouldn't match up because apparently he was a poisoner. Hmm. So it's like he, get he your... killed his victims through poison, and such. So I'm not sure how we jumped from poison to butchering neck throat yeah it's like okay no i think you just want to be um now the next one is mary jill the quote ripper um she was the only female sp suspect who was convicted mm. of murdering um she had a couple other like lovers um that she basically committed murders of um yeah. and it was suspected that she may have she could be an option um they said that people claimed seeing her with bloodstained clothing walk around and that she was, they do believe she was a midwife at that time. There was some DNA testing that happened with her in 2006, but it came back inconclusive. So this is where the theory comes in of, was Jack the Ripper a woman? Was it Mary, this woman, or was it another midwife? Once again, talking about the 1880s, where if women were pregnant or going to be bearing children, um, they usually had a woman around as a midwife because they were more susceptible to being able to deliver the child with the uterus and uh, not having men involved with the birth of the child. I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting theory. I'm not going to, once again, I'm not going to say never say never, but I just feel like if you're overpowering a prostitute in the dark somewhere, yeah, you know, you'd ha like you're talking about overpowering a human being, even if it's like not the actual like dissection part. Mm -hmm. That would be really hard for a female to have the strength to overpower another female. And also, you're thinking about the outfits they used to wear back in the day, which was like the girdles and the eight different layers of skirting and tulle, and um, you know, the high like knicker pants that were like you know like the little like short pants thing that are underneath. So you're looking at this from like a different perspective. You you wouldn't be accepted in society if you weren't wearing those sort of garble. So how would someone wearing a girdle and mini girdles attack another feet? I don't you know like then you have to bend down on the ground and execute the dissection. Have you ever worn a girdle? That's all I'm going to say. Like, I have. I have steel bone corsets. And you cannot bend I've in those been. easily, can you? Have you tried them? 
Oh yeah, I've worked in them. Yeah, yeah, you can't bend in them yeah. easily. So it's like, I it, mean, you have to kind of rework how your body moves. It's not quite the <laughs> same. So it's possible. It's totally if you grew up with corsets, it's totally possible. It's just you you just have to be more mindful of the corset. Honestly, it's true. It's true. You <laughs> but, like you don't bend at the at the the stomach. You bend it like no. the, the leg and the hip. You're you, like you hinge at the hip. Yeah. Exactly. It's a hinge for sure, but but in other words, yes, you could kill someone mm. doing that. However, uh, I think it would be a timely or uh, more timely than what was already going on with the dissection process. That's my opinion on it. I think the the problem would be more the overpowering of them. Um, I don't think the bodies would really move too much from where the the murders happened. So. It'd be one of those overpowering, moving the body around would be more difficult. Now, this could be where the idea of a accomplice could work. If you, if she had an accomplice, then it would be easier to do that. Mm -hmm. But it would definitely be much more difficult, especially her approaching them to get them into a state of like not realizing that they were in danger and everything and doing the act and everything. So. It, I don't think it's impossible, but it definitely would be much more difficult. Well, and you look at the male ideology, which is what I think it was someone that had a mommy issues and that was just attacking women because they needed to take their aggression out. But if you're looking at it from devil's advocate from a female perspective, if it's a female midwife, like looking down upon prostitutes as essentially the scum of the earth, they are not um, in their eyes an entrepreneur and that they need to be essentially eliminated because they're ashamed to society. That would be like the motive, I would assume, for a, a female. I don't think it would be out of jealousy or hate. I think it would be out of um, eliminate these uh, people that shouldn't be a part of our you know, building in this community. The only thing I could see them being connected would be if the, if the women had been <clears throat> somehow, if, if she thought that they were I've been lovers of true. Of her okay, husband, good. Yeah, or, true. Um, had been uh, not her husband, but, but her lover had been somehow romantically or just physically connected to her lovers and whatnot, and she wanted to take her anger out on them that way. Um, but Still I know sometimes talk about women be more poisoners than um, aggressive yes. like this was. It's true. If you do any criminal psychology, because once again, I'm studying because I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> women, um, even suicides, if you're talking about female suicides or women that are murderers, mm -hmm. they do things the least messy possible. So yeah. one side is when you, if you unalive yourself, you don't want to do it in a way that you will leave a mess for others to clean up where men will just take a gun and that'll be the end of it. They don't care what they leave behind. And it's the same on the murdering side when you have, like, think of Dorothea Puente. You know who she was, the uh, little old lady serial killer? She was killing people and literally taking their, I know, I don't know how this 80-year-old woman was dragging bodies into her garden. But she, she didn't, she, but once again, she didn't want to leave a mess, so mm. she knew to bury them in the ground. That is the she way. She had to have everything prepped. That's the only thing I can figure. She had it all prepped and ready to go. <laughs> but like literally, so she didn't want to leave a mess, and she didn't. You're yeah. right. They don't. Women serial killers don't really like to do it messily, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I mean, Eileen Wernos is another kind of discussion, but like she also had daddy issues and vengeance. But mm -hmm. like this person was like, it was. They didn't see these people as human. They saw them as an experiment, and I feel like. And like dissect, it was it was literally a dissection. I don't think they had remorse for the person at all. Well, I think that's where the difference could be. Where if it was a female, and the how grizzly was, it would be something of a passion of uh, getting really getting revenge on them and just wanting to uh, erase everything from them. Essentially, um, with poisoning, it seems to oftentimes be I think more. Um, they know the people, they they have some sort of emotional connection with them. They don't want to, they, 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 for, they just find their mind, I'm going to kill these people, but I want to do it in the least 
painful way possible weird stuff yeah. painful way possible mm -hmm. but with these were it was very passionate and like i want to just destroy you well and that's i think the difference too and how the murders outplay too because if you look at someone who like just like poisons somebody and that's it they're dead and then you look at someone who's like eventually like not jack the ripper even because jack the ripper yeah they did the cut the throat thing and then they did the dissection but if you look at other serial killers where they violently attack people, even Ted Bundy, like, knocking someone out with a sledgehammer, or, like, when they say they came up and they had 150 stab wounds, that is, like, mm -hmm. anger, vengeance. Like, oh, yeah. I need to get my anger out on this person. So it is interesting how this, although Mary Kelly, like, the last one was, like, super, super mutilated, it wasn't in an, uh, it was in a scientific way. It's, I know that sounds strange. Like, it was done in a non-mutilated sort of way because it was done in a dissection direction. So it, it, it was strange. like, she really was taken apart and yeah. everything and wanted to see every piece of her. Mm -hmm. So it and does make you wonder what was the motivation behind it? And it was always in the uterus, the yeah. female parts. It is strange. It's very strange. And then the, the, like, the murders just kind of stopped and then that was it. So on one hand, it could have been one of these people of accusations. They knew that they were under the, the hot seat if this person has money, maybe they left and went to a different country in Europe. Then on the other side, you have um, maybe this person was like, you know what, they're catching on to me. I think I need to stop. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is where I wonder, okay, if, okay, let's say if Mary Kelly was the actual last one that Jack the Ripper did, it makes you think that this was either opportunity perfect opportunity we have it in a room private we can do whatever we want or this person was special they had some sort of connection with them they saved this her for last because she had some link with the person which could go back to the prince albert theory yeah but we i think that's know. one of why they keep going back to that one <laughs> yeah it's because they were all linked because they were all kind yeah. of in a friend group too so the last thing is the paranormal activity is just unbelievable there's paranormal mm -hmm. activity connected to all of these locations so um yep. catherine has been spotted near quote ripper square which is really mm -hmm. interesting people have seen her like apparition um and then like a body where it looks like where she was found and it has a glow around her i found that really interesting and oh yeah. Annie Chapman was found in the backyard. People hear her gasping or breathing for air. They can hear like the sounds or the swishing of a knife. They've also mm -hmm. seen what it looks like a headless apparition of a woman that is seen walking in the backyard down the street and outside the alley. Oh my god, Jesus Lord. Which I find weird. I have to look back because like I know her throat was slashed, but I didn't I don't remember it being like cut so far that the head was removed. It may not have been, but it may have just been like almost residual activity where like there was so much yeah. trauma done that it's just a replay. It may not actually just be her. It might just be that, that tape player stain in the atmosphere. Um, there's another Ten Bells pub. We've heard about this. This is one of the most famous ones. This is where people claim that they see Annie Chapman and Mary Kelly in the pub frequently. Mary Kelly's bloody handprint is said to reappear on the wall of the room at 13 Miller's Court where her body was found. And in the 90s at Ten Bells pub, once again, that's... There's, Ten Bells pub is always all over talking about Jack the Ripper. Like, it's very connected. Um, they say there's a phantom of a man that's dressed in Victoria clothing and apparition... Um, and they'll see him lying in the bed next to them. So I would love to go there someday and just do a full investigation and dissect the shit out of the whole case, wouldn't you? And honestly, these um, sightings like, make me wonder, like you said, I wonder if most of these might be just not intelligent but more residuals just because they were such grisly acts and so traumatizing to the area that it just really did imprint stained it onto that space and it might not be an actual like intelligent honey but just around the anniversary it just goes off mm -hmm. we're gonna get there someday we're gonna go there and yeah. we're gonna film because it's gonna be amazing so that's the tea so on I, jack the ripper I, so who do you think was jack the ripper i'm not sure i mean i mean there's so many different ones different suspects it was Lewis Carroll. No. <laughs> he planned it so long ago. It he was exactly Sweeney Todd. That was... <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
Um, which they think Sweeney Todd was obviously based on the character, too, of, like, slashing the throat type of thing and, like, screenplay. Is, is Walter Sickett, the, pa- the painter and everything, like, there's, like, two books out now uh, that the writer Patricia Cornwall has done. She did originally Portrait of a Killer in 2002, and then recently she did another one uh, called Ripper, which is more about the painter and everything. So I, apparently she's very gun ho that this this is the Ripper. Wow. I'm not so sure because they base a lot on the the paintings mm-hmm. and like well the news was everywhere. I mean mm-hmm. if you if you see all the news and you see the description and your artist your imagination will do the rest just fine. You don't I don't think it he's the Ripper. <laughs> I agree. I think I don't know if it's any of these people in particular. I think that if anyone could be squared, yeah. in my opinion, it may have been Prince Albert, but I don't think it was him doing the murders. It was like, if he was part of the royal family, he had money to pay someone to do it, to make oh, it look, yeah. you know, so that sounds more feasible to me, just because he supposedly did get her pregnant and then all these people were connected. So, mm-hmm. in my opinion, yes, but then... The question is, is that when people go in to investigate, they're not asking the right questions, like, who's the Ripper? Well, he may not even, it may not even be him, it may be, like, an altered image of Prince Albert that we're not getting specifically here. So, yeah. I don't know. I feel like just somebody needs to go in there. There's got to be better evidence than what's been presented. Like, okay, if, okay, with the Tractor Ripper, I feel like it might have been... I could, they interviewed so many people, they had so many suspects that just slipped through and everything. I could see it was someone who wanted to tease the press and tease the cops about who they are, who got, they did the, the murders and everything, stopped when it was getting possibly too close or they were getting too close to being caught, and just went into hiding and disappeared like mm-hmm. but i know sometimes they talk about how with serial killers it's not like something they can just stop mm-hmm. and never do again which is why the theory of prince albert hiring someone would make sense to me mm-hmm. because he was just hired to do some murders not necessarily doing them out of the serial killer ideology like criminal not, not driven to exactly it. not driven he was hired yeah. to do it. or hired to make it look like a serial killer and mm-hmm. what more perfect than someone who's suspected of being a doctor or physician? Well, do you think that maybe that they were doing that to distract the general public from possibly a scandal that could have been happening with the royal family? That 100. they like, we'll have them focus on this and not think about that. Well, and, and you're focusing on something that doesn't even make sense because you're looking for a mm-hmm. serial killer who clearly has some sort of anatomy experience. You're never yeah. going to find him. You're never going to find oh, him. No. So, but you're causing, you're, you're stirring up drama on, like, just with the people itself. So mm-hmm. you're completely distracted from what is actually could be happening, which is possibly Prince Albert getting prostitutes pregnant. Clearly, if you're sleeping around that much to get syphilis, you've done something wrong, if that's what happened. Once again, I feel like there's so many files that could be accessed even on that. Like, what, what allegedly he got syphilis and ended up in an asylum. Why is this alleged? Like, I feel like those stories don't just come out of anywhere. There has to be some sort of facts behind it. How come someone hasn't tried to access the something, some sort of records on it? There's got to be records somewhere. That's where Elfie comes in. She will be in the libraries living there for two weeks. <laughs> I think the problem is, is this will, this would come back to the Royal Medical uh, Files, the Royal Medical Field area, that keep, probably keep those files are under lock and key and let no one see them and that's so probably the, yeah, why no one has figured out who did it honestly yeah uh, and how the thing you, is too, it's crazy it's crazy oh yeah and the thing is too it most likely wasn't someone who lived in what in that area because if it was someone who lived in that area everyone would have figured out who it was eventually like people talked mm-hmm. and like everyone knew everyone else so people would have figured it out mm-hmm. So I think it was someone probably outside of the White Chapel area, possibly someone who had money to be able to afford to basically keep themselves out of out of the list of suspects, or at least keep it low that they wouldn't be suspected. Mm-hmm. I agree. And especially if it was an aristocrat person, such as a surgeon or a doctor, it would be easy to hide. 
You're not going to yep. be oh, questioned. Yeah. How dare you question me if I'm a murderer? I'm sitting here doing my job from, you know, anatomy school and helping the public survive. How dare you question me and my aristocrat status of being very wealthy? Oh, yeah, no, you'd hear plain cases where they talk about this is an upstanding person and they're greatly respected mm -hmm. by their peers. And usually it was the, that was enough where, like, oh, they could have never done anything bad. And you're literally hiding in plain sight in public. You're hiding in Pretty public. Pretty much. Pretty much. So that is the T on Jack the Ripper. Who do you guys think it is? Leave us comments below on what you think happened. We love to hear your theories. Thank you to Elfie. We did kick ass on this stream. Feels good to be back. Oh, my it's last so stream nice is not back. up. I know that you guys, there was an issue uploading it. I had people messaging me. I just honestly haven't gotten around. I have to re-edit it and re-export it, and I just haven't done it. So I will. It over the export too, so. Oh God, that export. It's not thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened, but it was like glitching for some people. So I just took yeah. it down and I was like, I'll just re-export it later. So mm -hmm. I'll probably, this one's, when I when we actually stream like with Elfie live, it's easier for me to export it now. So I'll probably export this one and then roll back to the other one. Probably not till next week though, guys. I've still been, <laughs> I'm never going to have a vacation, Elfie. We have to go on vacation. Elfie's hey. going to be dragging me in a wagon, right, Elfie? Yep, it's going to be bedazzle wa wagon. A gothic bedazzle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you're going to be handing me endless margaritas and just, just, if you see my body being drugged by Elfie, just ignore it. She's not Jack the Ripper, I promise. She's Don't just... worry, she, she's alive, it's okay. Yeah. I, I poke her every once in a while, look, she twitches, she's alive. Oh my god, yeah, I'm hoping we're, we're all going to try to go on vacation, um, hopefully either October, and if that doesn't work, then probably won't be till spring but you know what I'm just gonna roll the punches you know what i'm saying just gotta deal with it so make it work it'll be fine yeah be fine. i'll be fine just like just give me some <laughs> caffeine and it's fine you know but um, oh yeah next week's with cat i can't remember what we're doing next week cat and i are crazy we never do we're always all over the place i don't know where we're at next week but it's fun so make sure you guys tune in for that make sure you guys are following us on social media um, our TikTok account is blowing up. I think we have like a thousand or two going now followers. So follow nice. us on TikTok. Yes, my TikTok's good. Make sure you follow us. Got to get Elfie on TikTok next. <laughs> no, I'm good. Oh my gosh. So make sure you guys are following us. Um, this will be a podcast. It'll be uploaded follow on Crystal. all major streams. <laughs> What's that? I said follow Crystal on TikTok. Follow her, Crystal. Her, her, her I'll TikToks get, are cool. <laughs> I'll get I'll get Elfie on eventually. We'll get there. You know what I mean? Maybe when we're on vacation, we'll get Elfie in on a couple of TikToks. <laughs> so thank you Teach guys me so much. Teach me some of the dances. They'll be fine. <laughs> I, I, can't, I won't do the dances. I won't do the dances. <laughs> like, I was a cheerleader in high school, so I'm very, like, go team. Like, so just dancing is just, it'll come out, look, I'll look like a cheerleader. Nope. We're just going to skip that. Skip the dances. You know what I'm saying? So... Make sure you guys follow us. Make sure you download our podcast. It'll be on all major streams probably tomorrow. If you need to find out where to find our podcast, please go to ghostgirldiaries.com. And as always, we will catch you guys next time. Thank you, guys. Back from the dead.